Greetings, fair strangers, and welcome back to the Chipmunk Channel. Upon this day, yea, verily, we... I can't keep this up. Basically, today is another round of the best-selling novel of such and such a year. Today, we cover the novel from the year 1900. 120 whatever years ago. I mean, my God. <laughs> Time flies. I will not keep you in suspense any longer. The novel from 120 whatever years ago, the best-selling American novel of 1900 is... To Heaven to Hold by Mary Johnston. To Heaven to Hold by Mary Johnston. Copyright 1900 by Houghton Mifflin. My edition has the stamp Maddie E. Maneri as owner, plus there's a handwritten recipe in the front. I love that. There are eight illustrations listed as being by Howard Pyle, E.B. Thompson, A.W. Betts, and Emlyn McConnell. I wonder if they each did two or if they divvied it up differently. Mary Johnston was a fairly popular author of the time. Born November 21st, 1870 in Buchanan, Virginia, she was the eldest of her siblings, and her father was a veteran of the Civil War. She was sick a lot as a child, so her family hired tutors instead of sending her to school. Her father worked for the railroad, and when she was 16, his work sent him and the family to Birmingham, Alabama. Soon after, she went to the Atlanta Female Institute and College of Music in Georgia, but she only was able to attend for three months. Her mother passed away, so she had to go back home to help take care of her father and younger siblings. Her books were usually historical fiction romances, and they incorporated themes of early feminism. Her first one, Prisoners of Hope, was published in 1898 and was set in colonial Virginia, as were two of her other books, including To Have and To Hold. As was common in the day, the books were usually serialized and published in book form afterward. In total, this woman wrote 23 novels, many short stories, two narrative poems, and one stage play, the name of which I couldn't find out, unfortunately. Johnston was heavily involved in women's suffrage, and her 1913 novel, Hagar, upset many more conservative men and women who felt its progressive ideas were too strong. She was a great friend of, among others, Gone with the Wind author Margaret Mitchell, who is said to have stated, I hesitate to write about the South after having read Mary Johnston. I kind of want to say that in a Southern accent. Was Margaret Mitchell Southern? I hesitate to write about the South. Sorry. To Have and to Hold is arguably her most popular work, becoming an immediate bestseller on its publication. It was made into two silent film versions within her lifetime. One is from 1916, May Murray in her film debut. The other was made in 1922, featuring Burt Lytell and Betty Compson, and unfortunately this one's lost. Not listed in most articles in this book, which I just happened to come across through my searching, is a newer version from 2014, featuring Aidan Turner, Mark Dacascos, Kelly Grayson, Travis Willingham, and Stargate SG-1's Christopher Judge. I love him. I love seeing anything different that he's in. Give him a chance to stretch his wings. Let him act. Unfortunately, I can't find where to actually watch the film or I would totally check it out, particularly as they seem to have changed some of the names for no reason at all, some of the plot circumstances, and Christopher Judge's character, Samson, is not in the book. So he's a completely new character they added for whatever. The book itself clocks in at 403 pages, so it is not an unhefty read. As said, it is set in colonial Virginia. We meet Rolf Percy, a bachelor and gentleman of some little wealth and status. He is friends with John Rolf. The story picks up after the death of Pocahontas, who Rolf remembers fondly. Many of the settlers in Virginia are single men, and to alleviate that error, a boat is due in from England with a bevy of young ladies set to marry whoever will have them. Of course, the men get to choose, but it is shown that the maidens have to agree. Rolf isn't excited about the idea of marriage, but he decides his home must have a caretaker. What a romantic. So off he goes. When the women arrive naturally, there is one who is not like the other girls, who seems to have a noble bearing. He is immediately captivated and earns her gratitude when another man attempts to attack her honor, and Rolf steps in. His minister friend marries him and the woman, who gives her name as Patience Worth, on the spot. Soon enough, she reveals that her name is in fact Jocelyn Lee, and the reason why she has concealed this arrives on the very next boat. 
Lord Carnal, whose name is a little on the nosy, is a favorite of the king's, and he has been macking on the king's ward for ages, and has received the king's blessing to marry her. Naturally, nobody cared what she thought about all of this, so she took what she saw as the best of her few options. This is bad for Rolf, as he doesn't have standing to fight the king, and the marriage looks set to be annulled at best. The two end up fleeing in the night by boat, accompanied by Rolf's servant Dickon and his minister friend Jeremy Sparrow. Lord Carnal accosts them. They knock him out and stick him in the boat so he cannot alert anyone. They end up washed onto a small barren island and determine that this must be the end. However, Rolf discovers a pirate ship has docked on the other side of the island. The pirates are trying to determine who will be their next captain. Rolf inserts himself into the discussion and bests his opponents, as he sees no other way for him and his companions to survive. So they sail off again on the pirate ship, although the pirates do not fully trust that he is as scurvy as they. Their suspicions are confirmed when he refuses to fire upon a passing British ship, and instead runs the pirate ship onto a reef. The British ship takes them all prisoner and hangs the pirates. They recognize Jocelyn and head back to Jamestown with her. She gives an impassioned speech on Rolf's behalf, which helps turn many sympathies, but still, this is up to the king. Back in Jamestown, Rolf is put in jail. A message comes that Jocelyn is pining away and must see him. He escapes and, with his servant, goes to see her, but it is a trap set by Carnal, who ambushes him with a cohort of Native Americans he has enlisted. In the tussle, Carnal is severely wounded, and Rolf and Dickon are taken prisoner by the natives. They are nearly put to death when Nantaquis, brother to Pocahontas and friend of Rolf, intervenes. They are then told that Opechancanuffin, the area chieftain, has asked that they be detained for five days so that he can meet with them. Rolf is suspicious, but recognizes that it is best to do what is ordered. Soon Nantaquis confirms his suspicions. There is an uprising being planned against the white settlers, and Rolf is being detained so there will be no chance of his warning the colony. Also, they plan to kill him and Dickon as they walk back. He and Dickon are able to turn the tables on their would-be attackers and race back through the treacherous countryside. Dickon is killed on the way, but Rolf manages to make it back just in time to warn and prepare at least part of the widespread colony. He also finds Carnal, who has fallen from the king's favor and realizes he has nothing left, so has taken a slow-acting but deathly poison. Unfortunately, Rolf also finds out that Jocelyn was so upset at his having disappeared that she has run off into the forest in an attempt to find him. Presuming her dead, Rolf first helps to successfully defend the colony, then heads into the forest himself in what he believes a fool's errand to attempt to find and recover her body. However, he eventually finds her alive. The minister Sparrow saw her go and went after her, and has been helping her survive all this time. The two return to Jamestown, and are finally able to live their lives together in peace. Okay, so this novel is a fairly well-spun yarn. And it's fairly well written, particularly in spots. Allow me to read the opening paragraph. That really struck me. The work of the day being over, I sat down upon my doorstep, pipe in hand, to rest awhile in the cool of the evening. Death is not more still than is this Virginian land in the hour when the sun has sunk away, and it is black beneath the trees, and the stars brighten slowly and softly, one by one. The birds that sing all day have hushed, and the horned owls, the monster frogs, and that strange and ominous fowl, if fowl it be and not as some assert a spirit damned, which we English call the whippoorwill, are yet silent. Later the wolf will howl and the panther scream, but now there is no sound. The winds are laid, and the restless leaves droop and are quiet. The low lap of the water among the reeds is like the breathing of one who sleeps in his watch beside the dead. Now, the lead Rolf is an honorable man. He's brave and he's likable enough. He stands by his woman, and he's more than willing to help her defend himself. He comes to love her not just for her looks, but for her spirit and her mind. Jocelyn herself is a woman who knows her own mind and is not prepared to give in to what everyone else wants for her. She falls in love with Rolf only after time and consideration and his proving his worth. Carnal, obviously, is a big jerk face and a villain you don't mind rooting against. There are some interesting prejudices of the day. Jocelyn has a servant, a black woman named Angela, who we don't get to know much about other than her being devoted to her mistress. Carnal has a hanger-on in the form of an Italian doctor, and this one is pretty bad. 
The man is portrayed as disturbing, not only in his demeanor, but his looks. And I can only imagine that any Italians of the day must have been reading this and going, huh? What? Excuse me? Lastly, Rolf's prejudices against the natives exist. And they are interestingly varied. The natives are alternately described by him as being simple, foolish, brave, noble, sneaky. It often depends who he's talking about, but not always. He has never trusted Obachan Kanov, Kanov, for example, and it turns out his suspicions are correct. Nantakwas, on the other hand, is what would be termed at the time as the quote-unquote noble savage. That basically means someone who's cool enough with the white settlers and, and is like, can't we all just get along, guys? He is definitely on Rolf's side, but partway through he demonstrates that his loyalty to his people has also not wavered. He can't have it both ways, but he goes as far as he is able on behalf of both. So, as has been the case with many of these books so far, prejudices of the day existed and are demonstrated in this book, so be aware. Now, basically, to wrap up, if you are not up for a hefty dose of romance, adventure, buckles being swashed, then give this one a miss. Otherwise, this one is good to check out. Just be ready for a haul of 400 pages. <laughs> And that's it. That was my wrap-up for this week. Until next week, take care of yourselves and each other. Much love to you. Hang in there, and I will see you next time. Bye!